<laughs> hey everyone, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the Humanities Teaching App, and back for the seventh installment of our discussion of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice is Jennifer Avery. Right. All right. Well, uh, the last. Uh, time hey, hey, hey. Oh, yeah. Before we do that, <laughs> you know what I want you to do. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just uh, I, I, I'm an editor, and if any, and a tutor, and if anyone is interested in um, contacting me about editing a manuscript, or if you would like creative writing lessons, or um, uh, grammar tutoring, or literature, or anything like that, I can do that. Uh, my email is j avery s c e at gmail dot com, and that again, that is j avery s c e at gmail dot com, and just uh, shoot me an email, let me know what you want, and I'll give you a rate. <laughs> You will not be disappointed. Is it becoming any easier to promote yourself, Jennifer? A little bit. It's not. It's not in my nature, man. It's really not in my nature. But I, I got to learn how to do it. I know. <laughs> but thank you for letting me practice. Yeah, yeah. If you're watching on the YouTube video right now, we're, Jennifer's uh, Jennifer is more than a shadowy figure. Uh, yeah, I, I have no idea what's going on with my camera today, but uh, there it is. That's okay. That's okay. I think people are familiar enough with your image throughout the uh, <laughs> numerous lessons that we've done here on hey, the Noetic app. Uh, Y'all can guess at my weird facial expressions. <laughs> right, right. So, hey, what are we going to be covering today? Okay, well, I'm going to try to do chapters 16 through 18. And much Let's of do it. this has to do with Mr. Wickham and Mr. Collins and the ball at Netherfield. Because when we left off... Uh, I love balls. I, I love yeah. I love dances. <laughs> it would be, yeah. Uh, it, I think it would be kind of fun if we still did them like this. <laughs> well, you know what I was thinking the other day? Uh-huh. I, I, I'm really into Puritan, like, sermons and stuff like that. Is there any place where I can do, like, Puritan cosplay or anything like that? Uh, Colonial Williamsburg, maybe? <laughs> Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> Yeah, but we should have we should have these. Um, Monticello. No, these aren't. Yeah. These aren't Puritan balls, but these are uh, you know Victorian balls or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, they're Regency balls. Regency. Yeah, that's very important. Victorian. The Victorian era is after the Regency era, and people get that kind of lump them together because they're right up next to each other. But this is when King George the Third. What had been declared insane, and the prince regent George the Fourth was—he wasn't the king, but he was the prince regent. He was the ruling uh, monarch in the absence so outside, of King George, King George III. So, outside of of these shifts in in patriarchs, what what's the difference between the regency period and the Victorian period in regards to dances? Not much, probably. Uh, not much. Uh, because, and that's part of why they get lumped together so much, is because uh, it, as far as society and culture, they're pretty much... Uh, they're, pretty, they're very similar. And of course, in the Regency period, you have uh, the Napoleonic Wars going on. And, I, and if I'm not mistaken, then uh, England was in a little bit more financial strife during the Regency period uh, than in Victorian period, because the Victorian era was considered a golden age. Uh, and, and that, and because of, uh, you know, the age of enlightenment and all of these things that were going on, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, they had stability, and the Industrial Revolution took place during Victoria's reign, uh, and she was just the queen for so long. Uh, she, I think she was on the throne for 60 years. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, the, the, but culturally there's not a huge difference, except when you start getting into the Industrial Revolution, when the middle class began to exist, when the middle class was kind of born. From this gentry era, uh, the Industrial Re Revolution made that possible because tradesmen 
were then capable of making more money uh, with uh, the Industrial Revolution. So, there you go. Right on, right on. Thank you for the clarification. So, proceed. Okay. But in any case, uh, we had uh, the last chapter, uh, Elizabeth had just met Mr. Wickham. And, uh, and that was uh, just outside on the street before they went up to see their aunt. And Mr. Collins is along with them. And they have, they have been invited to uh, sort of a dinner party with their aunt, uh, Aunt Phillips Samaritan. And so in chapter 16, they're, they're actually attending Aunt Phillips' party. And Mr. Wickham is there, and Mr. Collins comes along with them. And we also learned in the last chapter that uh, Mr. Collins had spoken to uh, Mrs. Bennett about marrying one of the daughters. And he had pretty much, and after Mrs. Bennett uh, told him, oh, well, Jane's probably going to be engaged soon, Mr. Collins decides that he's going to go after Elizabeth, uh, much to her chagrin. <laughs> but... Uh, don't know much to Lizzie chagrin, not Mrs. Bennett, because Mrs. Bennett's happy about it. Uh, but in any case, um, so at the, the beginning of chapter 16, they're going to Aunt Phillips' dinner party. And and uh, Elizabeth is excited to see that Mr. Wickham is there. Because she says that she hadn't really been thinking about him much, but then she saw him at the party and she began to see that in comparison with the other officers who were very gentlemanly fine bunch of dudes mr wickham stood out among them uh he was he's he has a, a very easy uh manner about him he's good looking and he's dressed well and all of that and so a lot and so everybody his attention is on Mr. Wickham because he's a new person to the circle and he's attractive and he's very pleasant to speak to. Uh, and uh, Mr. Wickham, uh, so all everybody goes, goes in to start to play cards before supper. And thankfully for Lizzie, Mr. Collins ends up at the table with Mrs. Phillips. And uh, Lydia, uh, who is you, who would have probably uh, taken all of taken all of Mr. Wickham's attention because she talked so much and he wouldn't have been able to refuse talking to her. Uh, Lydia is too excited by a game of lottery tickets is the name of the game that they're talking that they're playing and it's basically uh, you have to I think you you have to I don't know exactly how it's played but there's a lot of noise involved. It's basically like making bids and and uh and bets and you have to talk a lot to each other and that's why lydia likes it and so she's in, kind of engaged by the game and so lizzie gets to talk to mr wickham in relative quiet and so uh at elizabeth immediately finds that she likes mr wickham he's very he's got very nice manners and he talks very easily he doesn't seem to be hiding anything which we find out later on may not be the case uh but uh in any case um mr Co everybody completely forgets about mr collins and now everybody's thinking about mr wickham and lizzie gets to talk to mr wickham and um let me see here. And uh, she, now Elizabeth, remember that Elizabeth had seen, when they met Mr. Wickham on the street in Meriton, uh, uh, Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy came up. And Mr. Darcy gave Mr. Wickham a very, very cold reception. And the, it was obvious that they knew each other, uh, but it was also obvious that they didn't really like each other. And so Lizzie, this has been in Elizabeth's head. And so when she's talking to Wickham, she really wants to ask about this, but she feels it would be impertinent of her or rude to ask about it because it wasn't her business. But Mr. Wickham volunteers it, which should be a red flag. But, you know, Lizzie doesn't know any better at this point. But in any case, so Mr. Wickham starts talking about Mr. Darcy. And first of all, uh, they start talking about how he's received, how people like him. And Mr. Wickham says, well, you, you wouldn't find a lot of people who think badly of him. 
And Lizzie is amazed by this. And she's like, well, nobody here likes him. And so Mr. Wickham goes on and, uh, and says, oh, well, um, and Mr. Wickham says, oh, well, I can't pretend to be sorry that people don't like him here. Uh, and, uh, he says that that he or any or that any man should not be as estimated beyond their deserts, but with him, I believe it does not often happen. The world is blinded by his fortune and consequence, or frightened by his high and imposing manners, and sees him only as he chooses to be seen. So, Mister Wickham says that if, like, I know he's he's not really a good person, but he's because he's rich, because he's good looking. And because his he comes from an old family, people think well of him, and that's the only reason. And he, and he makes sure that people think well of him, essentially. And uh, Lizzie Lizzie hears this, and she's like, "Well, I mean, if you don't like him so much, then I hope that it doesn't make you want to leave." And he's like, "Oh, well, it's not for me to be driven away by Mr. Darcy. If he doesn't want to see me, he needs to go." Uh, and uh, he goes into this whole sad story about how Mr. Darcy's father had promised Mr. Wickham a living, which is basically uh, a, the, uh, a state church and the land attached to it uh, to, uh, to Mr. Wickham because Mr. Wickham says that he wanted to join the church. He says that he wanted to join the church. And uh, it was le and it, and the living was left to Mr. Wickham in in the late Mr. Darcy's will, uh, but he says that the current Darcy refused to give it to him. And so we have this long sad history about how Mr. Wickham didn't get what he was supposed to get because Mr. Darcy wouldn't let him have it, and. Um, and Elizabeth is shocked by this. Like she, she knows she doesn't like him, but she feels like this is beyond beyond anything. This is insult, and not even humane. Uh, it's not even human to treat somebody like this. And uh, she asks him, well, "Well, why didn't you go to the law about this? Why didn't you basically? Why didn't you seek legal redress? Which means why didn't you sue him over it?" Um, and Mr. Wickham very conveniently says there was just such an informality in the terms of the bequest as to give me no hope from law. Uh, he says a man of honor could not have doubted the intention, but Mr. Darcy chose to doubt it or to treat it as merely conditional recommendation and to assert that I had forfeited all claim to it by extravagance, imprudence, in short, anything or nothing. Certain it is that the living became vacant two years ago, exactly as I was of an age to hold it, and that it was given to another man. And no less certain is it that I cannot accuse myself of having really done anything to deserve to lose it. I have a warm, unguarded temper, and I may perhaps have sometimes spoken my opinion of him and to him too freely. I can recall nothing worse. But the fact is that we are very different sort of men and that he hates me. And so, and I, and I forgot to mention that Mr. Wickham is the son of the man who was the late Mr. Darcy's steward. So he was a lawyer who looked after the affairs of the estate, who helped, who helped him with the economics of, of the, uh, the budget and the rents and all these things on the estate. Mr. Wickham was that man's son, and that's why they grew up so close. But in any case, uh, Mr. Wickham uh, tells her that the only reason that Mr. Darcy didn't give it to him is because he didn't like him. And uh, and, and Elizabeth is 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 even more amazed by this. How in the world can you not can, can could he not? give you this living just because he doesn't like you when his father specifically wanted you to have it. And uh, he decides, and Mr. Wickham goes on to say it was a determined dislike, a dislike which I cannot but attribute in some measure to jealousy. Had the late Mr. Darcy liked me less, his son might have borne with me better. 
But his father's uncommon attachment to me irritated him, I believe, very early in life. He had not a temper to bear the sort of co co competition in which we stood, the sort of preference which was often given me. So essentially, Wickham is telling Lizzie that Mr. Darcy, the late Mr. Darcy, liked Wickham better than his own son, which has a little bit of a smell to it. To most people, I would think, to, to, to a lot of people, I would think, would say that when, when somebody tells you a sob story like this, and, and, uh, maybe this is just me, but when I hear a sob story like that, and everything is in detail, if you were really hurt, you probably wouldn't talk so much about it, you know? Uh, and But but anyway, that's just, that's just me. But in any case, um, so... And Elizabeth is just more liking Darcy less and less because of all of this that she's hearing from Mr. Wickham. She's like, this nice, handsome young man has been robbed of all he wanted because Mr. Darcy was jealous of him. How, how awful, how awful. And, uh, and she's convinced of it because of the way, uh, the way that Mr. Wickham kind of expresses it. Um... Let me see here. But at the same time, you have to think, well, Elizabeth kind of likes Mr. Wickham. And so she's got a little bias working, and she already doesn't like Mr. Darcy. Um, let me see here. And uh, and then they start, and they start talking about how bad this is. And, uh, and, uh, and Elizabeth says... That it's pride is the is the reason why Mr. Darcy is pretty much the root of all of Darcy's evil is this pride that she sees in him, uh, and they have this discussion about it. And Mr. Wickham says it is wonderful," replied Wickham, "for almost all his actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. It has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling." But we are none of us consistent, and in his behavior to me, there is stronger. There were stronger impulses even than pride. Can such abominable pride as his have ever done him good? Yes, it has often led him to be liberal and generous, to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor. Family pride and filial pride for he is very proud of what his father was, have done this. <coughs> Not to appear to disgrace his family, to degenerate from the popular qualities or lose the influence of the Pemberley House is a powerful motive. He has also brotherly pride, which with some brotherly affection makes him a very kind and careful guardian of his sister. And you will hear him generally cried up as the most attentive and best of brothers. So, when we learn later on what the truth of all of this is, you begin to see, you begin to see how Mr. Wickham is explaining away the reports that most people are going to give of Darcy. Like, you know, if you ask somebody in Derbyshire, which is where he lives, about Mr. Fisk William Darcy, they're all going to be very complimentary and say he's kind, he's generous, he gives he gives his money liberally, uh, he pays his servants well, he's kind to his tenants. If Elizabeth were to hear that, that would lessen what... Mr. Wickham has told her about how M Mr. Darcy treated him. But he explains this away by saying the only reason that he's generous like this is because of his pride, is because he's so proud of who he is and who his family was. So he's basically saying there is a nefarious side to Mr. Darcy's generosity. And that kind of covers him as far as what people might say about Darcy later on. Um, but Elizabeth is completely convinced by this. Um, 
and she asks about Miss Darcy, about Georgiana, and uh, that's uh, Mr. Darcy's little sister. And Wickham says that she is too much like her brother. She is very proud. Uh, and uh, she and he says, "Oh well, she you know she when she was younger, she was really sweet, and I I, I like to entertain her, and she was very fond of me. But now she's gotten she's had she's had too much. Her her brothers had too much influence over her, and now she's just like him." And again, this plays, this plays into something that happens later on very, very well, too. <clears throat> and so, after she... I should she, be interjecting with, with more questions so you can rest your place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, in any case, um... So, uh, Elizabeth has heard all of this about Mr. Darcy, and she's amazed, and she likes him even less now. It just, it just supports what she already thought about him. It's like this horrible, horrible, prideful man. What a jerk. <laughs> and look at what he's done to this nice, sweet, handsome man. And she's thinking about it, and she says, and, and she decides that she can't believe that Mr. Bingley would be friends with him. Because Mr. Bingley is such a nice guy, and he's such an amiable person, and he's all, he's very generous, and, and it doesn't add up to her. But we find out why it doesn't add up later, <laughs> because Wickham's flat out lying to her. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, and, and he asks, he asks, she asks him if he knows Mr. Bingley, and he says that she that he does he doesn't. And, again, Mr. Wickham very cleverly explains this away. He says, well, well, Darcy can please where he chooses. If people who are unequal, as far as money and title, he can be very pleasing and agreeable. And, you know, he, he's smart enough and mannered enough to be able to, to make people think he's a good guy. And that's basically what he says about... Uh, Darcy's relationship with the Bingley, and um, and that and that and after and that pretty much brings the conversation to an end uh, because all the card tables go away and they all go to supper. They'll have dinner, and uh, during uh, dinner we get a little bit more from Mr. Collins. Uh, Mr. Collins lost horribly at his card game because he didn't know how to play it. And he's saying, oh, well, I lost five shillings. Well, I'm not real worried about it because, you know, I make good enough money. I shouldn't worry about it. And he goes on about this for a couple of paragraphs. Uh, and um, he mentions Lady Catherine de Berg. And Wickham hears this. And uh, he says, uh, oh, well, you know, guess what? Lady Catherine de Berg is Mr. Darcy's aunt. So, uh, the de Berg family is connected to the Darcy family. And uh, nobody knew this at this point. And, uh, and then we find out that Lady Catherine de Berg's daughter, Anne de Berg, is betrothed to Mr. Darcy. It's one of those arrangements that the parents make at birth. Uh, it's like, uh, well, they, it's, it, it's not official, but the two mothers said, we're going to marry our kids to each other later on, is what the kind of arrangement this is, to kind of combine the estates. And that did happen a lot, uh, even back in those days. Like We, we consider a relationship, a relationship with a cousin to be incestuous now, but... It happened very often, even back, even in the Regency era, to keep family fortunes and family names intact. And that's the kind of arrangement that Lady Catherine de Berg had with Mr. Darcy's mother, is to keep the estates together and the money together. Um, and uh, and and when Elizabeth hears this, she she kind of laughs at uh, Miss Miss Bingley about how much attention she pays to Mr. Darcy and how much she flirts with him and 
and uh, and she wonders if if Miss Bingley even knows about this. And uh, let me see here. Okay, and then uh, and you know, Wickham, and then Elizabeth kind of asks about Lady Catherine, and she says Mr. Collins speaks highly both of Lady Catherine and her daughter. But from some particulars that he has re related of her ladyship, I suspect his gratitude misleads him, and that in spite of her being his patroness, she is an arrogant, conceited woman. And Wickham says, "I believe her to be both in a great uh, to be both in a great degree. I have not seen her for many years, but I, w I very well remember that I never liked her." and that her manners were dictatorial and insolent. She has the reputation of being remarkably sensible and clever, but I rather believe she derives part of her abilities from her rank and fortune, part from her authoritative manner, and the rest from the pride of her nephew, who chooses that everyone connected with him should have an understanding of the first class. So he's got to put in one last rib at Mr. Darcy. He's like, oh well, uh, well, I know she she she's really not that great of a lady, uh, but people think so because of her rank and her money, and because Mr. Darcy makes people believe that she is. Uh, and uh, so, and that's just one more rib at Darcy. And and after and and, and at this point, no, she can't really talk to Mr. Wickham for much more because too much is going on. And the at the de at dinner and the last paragraph is a little bit of kind of wrapping the evening up and kind of what Elizabeth thinks about Mr. Wickham after all this information is given. <clears throat> I don't usually talk so much. Right, um, and the last paragraph is a whatever he said was said well, and whatever he did done gracefully. Elizabeth went away with her head full of him. She could think of nothing but of Mr. Wickham and of what, he, of what he had told her all the way home. But there was not quite time for, for her even to mention his name as they went, for neither, neither Lydia nor Mr. Collins were once silent. Lydia talked incessantly of lottery, tickets and of, of, of lottery tickets, of the fish she had lost and the fish she had won, which were used as counters in this lottery tickets game. Uh, and Mr. Collins, in describing the civility of Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, protesting that he did not in the least regard his losses at whist, which is a card game, enumerating all the dishes at supper and repeatedly fearing that he crowded his cousins, had more to say than he could well manage before the carriage stopped at Longbourn House. So there was no silence between Lydia and Mr. Collins because Mr. Collins talks a lot and he talks long. So that's the end of chapter 16. <clears throat> right on. And so, um, just to recap there, we learn from Mr. Wickham that, uh, or, or Elizabeth hears from Mr. Wickham that Mr. Darcy is worse than she thinks he is. And she already thinks he's pretty bad. Uh, and he uses he uses the fact that he's unfamiliar, uh, that people don't know about his family. And Mr. Wickham uses it in his favor to kind of shift the uh, kind of shift the admiration and lack of admiration that he's used to receiving from people in his own neighborhood. Uh, but, um, but she learns from Dar she learns from Wickham that, uh, Mr. Darcy, uh, went against his father's wishes, wouldn't let Mr. Wickham have a living, wouldn't let him join the clergy, which is why he's forced into, uh, into the army. And, uh, and we learn that, uh, learn a little bit more, and, and, and Elizabeth, Lizzie kind of gets some uh, confirmation of Mr. Darcy's pride from Mr. Wickham. And so what's ha here's the prejudice part of Pride and Prejudice. Darcy's all the pride and Lizzie's all the prejudice at, at this point. 
because she's already made up her mind about Darcy that she's not going to like him. And everything she hears about him that confirms what she already believes, she's going to believe. Which is exactly the problem we have with American politics and a lot of things today is that people only pay attention to what backs up their opinion. And that's what's happening with Elizabeth here. And, and it's coming from this handsome, charming man who seems to be, who, who, who seems to feel deeply and seems to really, you know, be a good person, a good-hearted person. And he, he's, a, he's attractive again. And so she thinks, oh, well, this nice young man has just told me everything I needed to know about Darcy that I already knew, basically. So, um, so that's the end of chapter 16. In, the chap in chapter 17, uh, Elizabeth talks to Jane about all this that she heard. And, sweet, and Jane is so sweet that she's not going to believe it on it. She's not going to believe it. Uh, she's like, well, surely there's a mistake. Somebody misled them both somehow. And, you know, and I don't think Mr. Darcy's that bad. And I don't think anybody's that bad. And that's basically where Jane lays down on it. And, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and, and this little thing right here kind of gives you a, a, a difference between the sisters. Um, Jane says they have both been deceived, I dare say, in some way or other, of which we can form no idea. Interested people have perhaps misrepresented each to the other. It is, in short, impossible for us to conjecture the causes or circumstances which may have alienated them without actual blame on either side. Very true indeed. And now, my dear Jane, what have you got to say in behalf of the interested people who have probably been concerned in the business? Do clear them, too, or we shall be obliged to think ill of somebody. <laughs> so... Jane doesn't want to think badly of anybody, and say, like I said, she she's just trying to make an excuse in her head so nobody, so you know. But but Jane is actually very, you know, she she Jane Jane's actually makes a good point here. Is uh, <clears throat> is there might not be is, is uh, we don't know if we don't know everything that happened. We weren't there, so how can we know? And, and Elizabeth just, is just taking this at face value, and Jane's trying to get her to question, you know, I, she doesn't think anybody's to blame, but she's, at the same time, she's still trying to get Elizabeth to question, uh, not to believe it at face value, essentially. Um, in any case, um, let me see here. Uh, and, and Jane's also concerned with why again? Why Mr. Bingley would be so friendly with him if he was such a bad guy? And uh, and Lizzie says that I can. Mu uh, this this is a very important bit right here because this kind of tells you where Elizabeth is screwing up with Wickham. Is I can much more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being a, of can more easily believe Mr. Bingley's being imposed on than that Mr. Wickham should invent such a history of himself as he gave me last night. Names, facts, everything mentioned without ceremony. If it be not so, let Mr. Darcy contradict it. Besides, there was truth in all his looks. There was truth in his looks. Uh, and that's very important here because that's that's all that Lizzie's seeing at this point is this outward mannerism, and that that's why this is considered a comedy of manner manners and a satire in some ways a satire of the way that of the way that this society was conducted. People favored appearance over reality. And that's exactly what Lizzie's doing here, is she's favoring appearance over reality. Um, so in any case, um, let me see here. Okay, so the, so the two girls um, were talking in the shrubbery, and they get, and, and get kind of interrupted because Mr. Bingley, and, and, and lo and behold, here comes Mr. Bingley and his sisters, and they have come to invite 
the family to the Netherfield Ball. And again, a, a, a ball is a big deal back in this day. And, um, and, and after all the news goes around, we kind of get the, uh, the, the anticipation from everybody. Like, everybody's excited about this ball. <clears throat> um, but, uh, it says, The prospect of the Netherfield Ball was extremely agreeable to every female of the family. Mrs. Bennett chose to consider it as given in compliment to her eldest daughter and was particularly flattered by receiving the invitation from Mr. Bingley himself instead of a ceremonious card. Jane pictured to herself a happy evening in the society of her two friends and the attentions of their brother. And Elizabeth thought with pleasure of dancing a great deal with Mr. Wickham and of seeing a confirmation of everything in Mr. Darcy's look and behavior. The happiness anticipated by Catherine and Lydia depended less on any single event or any particular person, for though they each, like Elizabeth, meant to dance half the evening with Mr. Wickham, he was by no means the only partner who could satisfy them, and a ball was, at any rate, a ball, and even Mary could assure her family that she had no disinclination for it. So everybody's excited. And, um... <coughs> And Elizabeth, you know, she, she's looking forward to it. And Mr. Collins starts talking about and he, he's been invited, too. And Mr. Well, Mr. Collins starts talking about it. And uh, he's like, oh, well, you know, uh, and, and Elizabeth says, well, Mr. Well, Mr. Collins, would it be, oh, uh, you're, you're a clergyman. Do you think it would be appropriate for you to go to this ball and dance and everything? I was just trying to keep not to go. Uh, but, uh, um. And Mr. Mr. Collins is like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, you know, it's fine. I think it's given by a respectable person. And so I don't think that there's going to be any evil in it. And as a matter of fact, Miss Elizabeth, will you dance the first two dances with me? Uh, and like, oh, no. <laughs> and at this point, Lizzie's not, doesn't really know what Mr. Collins and Mrs. Bennett have agreed to. But this is where she begins to think, uh-oh. Wait a minute. Why is Mr. Collins asking me for the first two dances? Now, the, the way that it would happen back in this day was when there was a ball announced. Uh, it was a great honor, and it was it was it was flattering to be asked for the first two dances. And they usually asked, and the the man usually asked the woman for the first dance in person before the ball. And so, Mr. Collins asked Elizabeth for the first two dances. And that is a serious thing. That means that I have a preference for you. I'm going to give you this honor. I want you to be the first person I dance with. I want to make sure I dance with you. And I want to make sure I dance with you twice. Because I like you. That's basically like... Flirting <laughs> in the Regency era is asking for the first two dances, and I and, and in some cases that was almost like oh crap they're going to be engaged within a couple of weeks now, <laughs> you know that was a big deal, and so we get Can this you it? yeah yeah I, that, that, it, when you can't make out in the corner <laughs> while your mom's at work or something then this this is what you did <laughs> so. Um, and here's a little bit when she really begins to really begins to suspect something. She says Elizabeth felt herself completely taken in. She had fully proposed being engaged by Wickham for those very dances and to have Mr. Collins instead. Her liveliness had never been worse timed. There was no help for it, however. Mr. Wickham's happiness in her own was perforce delayed a little longer. And Mr. Collins's proposal accepted with as good a grace as she could. She was not the, the better pleased with his gallantry from the idea it suggested of something more. It now first struck her that she was selected from among her sisters as worthy of being the mistress of Hunsford Parsonage and of assisting to form a quadrille table at Rosings in the absence of more eligible visitors. The idea soon reached a conviction as she observed his increasing civilities towards herself 
and heard his frequent attempt at a compliment on her wit and vivacity, and though more astonished than gratified herself by this effect of her charms, it was not long before her mother gave her to understand that the probability of their marriage was exceedingly agreeable to her. Elizabeth, however, did not choose to take the hint. Being well aware that a serious dispute must be the consequence of any reply, Mr. Collins might never make the offer, and till he did, it was useless to quarrel about him. And so that's pretty much the end of chapter 17, uh, is Elizabeth kind of like, oh crap, Mr. Collins wants to marry me, and wait, I, but I want to, you know, but I want to get be, I want to hang out with Mr. Wickham, and it's just kind of, and she's excited for the ball, but at the same time, she now kind of understands what's going on, even though she doesn't take it seriously at first. Um, but in any case, that's the end of chapter 17. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, chapter 18 is the Netherfield Ball. Uh, the Netherfield Ball is a big freaking deal. This is a huge chapter. <laughs> Uh, that which is often the case with Jane Austen's novels because you've got to remember that uh, like a modern reader doesn't understand this like a reader back in you know back in her day would. Um, balls were everything because most of the time the young women of a house, the the the, the daughters of a gen of a gentleman and a gentlewoman did not get out of the house. They had friends that they visited with. They had friends that, you know, they had, uh, people would come and visit with them uh, anytime. And, and they and they would walk into town. They would visit houses in the neighborhood, and that was it. And that didn't happen until they were about 15 or 16 when they came out into society. Uh, and before then, they have no experience with men whatsoever, uh, except for their fathers and brothers. But a ball is where marriages and fates are decided in Regency era England. Uh, that was the only, that was the social event that would, that that society revolved around that the women revolved around because that's how they met husbands that how that's how they spoke to, to, to men that they might marry. That's how they got to know people was through these balls. And so this is a big freaking deal. Um, so in any case, the Netherfield Ball, here it comes. And um, right when she walks in, uh, Elizabeth is sure Mr. Wickham's going to be there. But she walks in and she can't find him right away. And, she, and, and it kind of occurs to her, wait a minute, Mr. Darcy might not have invited him. And it begins to dawn on her that he might not be there at all. And it hadn't even entered into her head that he wouldn't be there. Um, let me see here. Uh, okay, and so not long after she walks in, the absolute fact of his absence was pronounced by his friend Mr. Denny, to whom Lydia eagerly applied and who told them that Wickham had been obliged to go to town on business the day before, and was not yet returned, adding with a significant smile, I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now if he had not wished to avoid a certain gentleman here. So, remember how Mr. Wickham said, it's not for me to stay away from him. If he doesn't want to see me, he should go. Well, he just did the opposite, didn't he? That's another red flag. It's like, he says, I have nothing to be ashamed of, so I don't need to go anywhere. And now he's gone somewhere. Even though he said, he said that he doesn't have anything to be ashamed of. So that, that's... That should be a red flag right there that Ms. that Mr. Wickham just didn't show up even though he was invited. Um, so uh, um, and so at this uh, Elizabeth is just kind of depressed, you know. She's like, "Well, crap. 
and out I'm not going to be able to dance with Mr. Wickham at all. And then she's reminded of, oh no, and I have to dance these first two dances with Mr. Collins. Oh crap. And uh, she says, uh, um, Mr. Collins, awkward and solemn, apologizing instead of attending, which means paying attention, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, gave her all the shame and misery which a disagreeable partner for a couple of dances can give. The moment of her release from him was ecstasy. <laughs> so, it, it, not only is he obnoxious, but he's a crappy dancer. And uh, and that's embarrassing for the lady, because I mean, you know because she can't because because if she's got a bad partner then how is she going to enjoy it you know, and so that was pretty much it with that um, and she says she danced with an officer next and then she goes and starts talking to Charlotte Lucas, and uh, while she's tar talking to Charlotte Lucas uh, here comes Mr. Darcy. And a ma and he asked her for uh it's just, yeah yeah uh, yeah uh, Mr. Darcy asked her for a dance, which she would not have expected, but he does. And uh, and before I they didn't ask the lady to dance right when they were about to dance. Like uh, somebody like th there would be one going on. And then the gentleman would cross the room and say, hey, would you like to dance with me for the next one? And then they'd walk away or, you know, what, what have you. So after he asks and she says yes, he walks away. And Charlotte's there with her. And, and poor Lizzie is like, why did I say yes to him? I didn't even have time to think. I, was going to, I would have said no. Uh, and Charlotte says, I dare say you will find him very agreeable. Heaven forbid, that would be the greatest misfortune of all, to find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate. Do not wish me such an evil. When the dancing recommenced, however, and Darcy approached to claim her hand, Charlotte could not help cautioning her in a whisper. And remember, Charlotte Lucas is next to Aunt, uh, what is her name? Phillips and... Gardner. Uh, next to Aunt Gardner, Charlotte Lucas is probably the most intelligent woman in this book. Uh, Charlotte says um, not to be a simpleton and allow her fancy for Wickham to make her appear unpleasant in the eyes of a man of ten times his consequence. And Charlotte's got a very good point. Uh, She's kind of fawning over this guy who is a, uh, who's just like a soldier, an officer in uh, a militia. This is a local militia group. They didn't go overseas to fight. They stayed in the country. It's like the National Guard. Um, and, and that didn't have as much honor as a soldier who went overseas. Um, but in any case, Mr. Wickham is an officer and he says he's not worth a lot of money. He's not from a good family. He's not even really gentry. But then you have Mr. Darcy, who's worth an enormous amount of money, who has an enormous estate. Uh, if you are insulting to people of higher rank, that was a that was a big deal. You you showed your due respect to somebody who was higher than you in rank and that's kind of what Charlotte's saying here and and I think Charlotte kind of sees that Mr. Darcy likes Elizabeth even though Elizabeth can't see it herself Charlotte does and and I think that Charlotte might suspect a little bit of Mr. Wickham too uh, but in any case uh, Charlotte kind of tells her you know hold up don't be so mean and just you know just dance with him and be pleasant to him and uh, so they go in and they dance and she says Elizabeth made no answer and took her place in the set amazed at the dignity to which she was arrived in being allowed to stand opposite to Mr. Darcy and reading in her neighbor's looks their equal amazement in beholding it. So Lizzie does feel a little bit honored 
at being singled out by Mr. Darcy because he's the he because he, he's the man of the highest consequence in this room at this point. Nobody may, has more money or an older or an older name than Darcy. And so he is one of the most, he's probably the most important man in the room, and he's dancing with Lizzie. And so that would be something that would draw a lot of people's attention. It's like, whoa, wait a minute, is he dancing with Lizzie? Wow, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, uh, you know, lucky her, you know. Um, and so they start dancing, and they're not really talking to each other. And they had this conversation is very, very famous that they have while they're dancing. Um, they don't dance for a minute, and, and or they don't talk for a minute. And Elizabeth, by and by, kind of makes a little remark about you know the dance and everything. And she says, it is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some kind of remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. And so this is Elizabeth kind of teasing. Uh, and, um, and, and, and get his, his answer here, too, is, should be very telling to her, but she doesn't get it. Uh, he smiled and assured her that whatever she wished him to say would be said. So you got to think about this. Lizzie's kind of poking fun at him, and, I, and he just kind of smiles and says, "I'll say anything you want me to say, baby." <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't know. She doesn't see that though. But that's ba that's because he's really kind of got you know he's he's got the hots for her pretty hard at this point. Um, and and they and they kind of tease each other back and forth and. Uh, she says, and I love, and this is one of my favorite lines, uh, one must speak a little, you know. It would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together. And yet, for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged as that they may have the trouble of saying as little as possible. <laughs> and uh, he says, are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you are grat gratifying mine? Both replied uh, Elizabeth archly, and archly means teasingly. For I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, taciturn disposition, unwilling to speak unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to posterity with all the eclat of a proverb. <laughs> This is no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure, said he. How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. And so, but she's basically cut, you know, poking fun. It's like she says, we're both unsociable and don't want to talk unless we can say something important. But Darcy says, wait a minute, that's not you. And, uh, you know, so, and, and she's, and, and he's right. I mean, she's much more outgoing than he is. Um, but in any case, uh, um, let's see. Okay, and then they start talking, and, you know, and Mr. Darcy then asks about, you know, you know, how often do y'all go into Meryton? And, uh, and Elizabeth takes this opportunity to mention Wickham. She's like, oh, well, we were just, uh, making a new acquaintance when we saw you the other day and uh and he and darcy's face immediately changes his expression immediately cha uh, changes and uh, he doesn't say anything for a long time it's the very me mention of mr wickham and he says that mr wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. Now, there's a good hint about Wickham. Outward manners, outward attractiveness. He can make friends, but he doesn't keep them, which is usually a pretty good sign of somebody very charming who can easily meet and make people like them. But what's important is what follows, is how you is is how friends support each other how friends help each other out and how friends don't betray each other essentially and so Darcy's saying that he can make friends but he can't keep them which is a big deal really um 
But Elizabeth doesn't catch this. She doesn't think about it because she's already made up her mind. Darcy bad, Wickham good. That's 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 in her head, and that's nothing's going to change it at this point. And uh, and she and she actually uh, mentions it. She says he has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, and in a, and in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. And Darcy can't say anything because Mr. L because Sir William Lucas shows up in the middle of this and kind of and kind of interrupts them and so they don't really keep up the subject and uh dear, and, and William Lucas this part with William Lucas is a, is a little bit important too because uh, Mr., uh Sir William makes a hint about Bingley and Jane getting married and uh, this is the first time that somebody other than the mother has said anything about it. Uh, and so that means that the word is spreading, that everybody thinks that Bingley and Jane are going to get married. And this kind of makes Darcy watch them. Uh, he's like, wait a minute. Oh, do people think they're getting married? And so he starts watching Jane, Jane and Bingley. Uh, and this comes, becomes important later on. Um, and so, uh, and, and so, uh, Sir William goes away, and they start talking again, and, uh, they, and, you know, and, and he says, well, well, what, what do you think of books? And they, and he tries to talk to her about books, and, uh, and she says, well, I don't know, if, I don't know, uh, we probably shouldn't talk about that, because I doubt that we don't read the same things, um, uh, Oh, and this is, I like this part, too. Uh, they're talking, uh, he says, uh, uh, Lizzie says, I cannot talk of books in a ballroom. My head is always full of something else. The present always occupies you in such scenes, does it? Said he with a look of doubt. So he's saying, so and when, you're, when, when you're at a ball, all you're thinking about is what's going on around you. And he's, he kind of doubts it. It's obvious. And she says, yes, always, without knowing what she said, for her thoughts had wandered far from the subject, as soon afterwards appeared by her suddenly exclaiming, I remember, yeah, so he's, he's, he asks her, so you're, you're only paying attention to what's around you when you're at a ball, and you're not thinking of anything else. And she says, yes, while she's doing exactly the thing. <laughs> that Darcy thinks that she does. You know what I mean? Uh, she's doing exactly the opposite of what she says that she does. But which, is, it's a very subtle thing, uh, but I, I like it. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, and, and so she and me, like, after all of this, she's thinking backwards. Uh, while she's talking about how she always, her mind's full of the present, she's thinking about the past. And, um, uh, she says, I remember you say that you hardly ever forgave. And so she's kind of uh, ferreting him about uh, Wickham. She's, she's kind of trying to get more out of him about it. And uh, she says uh, that you're, you're, you're really careful to make sure that you don't resent anybody. Since you, once you resent somebody, your opinion's set. And he says that he is. And he says, you, and never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice, which is exactly what Lizzie, Lizzie is at this point. And he says, I hope not. Uh, it is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion to be secure of judging properly at first. And, and he asks her, well, why are you talking about that? Uh, and she says, I'm trying to figure you out. And he asks her, well, well, how are you doing with that? And she says, I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as puzzle me exceedingly. And he says, I can readily believe, answered he gravely, that reports may vary greatly with respect to me. And I could wish, Miss Bennet, that you were not to, that you were not to sketch my character at the present moment, as there is reason to fear that the performance would reflect no credit on either. And so... She's testing him. She's trying to kind of weasel him a little bit, and she and he said, and she basically is saying here, well, since you, since once you've lost, since, since 
once you've decided you don't like somebody, you never like them again. Uh, it, what, wouldn't you say that you're very careful to make sure that it's justified? And uh, she's, you know, so aren't you careful to make friends with people who are the least likely to disappoint you, essentially? And he says that he is. And, uh, <clears throat> and, 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 and he's asked, and then he decides to ask her, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting lost in my own head. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Right, and my voice is dying. Uh, <laughs> you take a moment. But, um, so basically she says, I'm trying to figure you out here. And he asked her how she's doing, and she says, I can't figure you out. Uh, because I hear opposite accounts. I hear different things, opposite things about you. And he says... Well, you know, it's pro this right here and now is probably not a good time or place for you to be figuring me out. And so he's given her the key that she needs to figure him out. Is that, again, like, like I said before, Darcy's an introvert. He doesn't know any of these people except the Bingleys. And so those are the people he's going to gravitate towards. Uh, because he knows them and he knows how to talk to them. And so he 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 he's he he feels out of place. He is out of place here, and that's why he says this. It's like, don't try to figure me out now because I'm I'm out of my place. I'm out of my comfort zone, and uh, and he says, uh, and she says. But if I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours, he coldly replied. She said no more, and they went down the other dance and parted in silence, on each side dissatisfied, though not to an equal degree. For in Darcy's breast there was a tolerable, powerful feeling towards her, which soon procured her pardon and directed all his anger against another. And so, when they leave each other at the dance, Darcy's disappointed because Lizzie, because Lizzie doesn't seem to like him any better. And it's pretty clear that he doesn't like her now. Doesn't like him now. And Lizzie's disappointed because she, ne she didn't get the admission of guilt that she thought she was going to get from Darcy. And when they leave each other on the dan at the dance, um... Uh, He's dis he, he's mad. Darcy's angry because of he, he he kind of understands now why she's got this bias against him and why it's gotten so much worse all of a sudden. And so he can't be mad, but he can't be mad at her. So he's mad at Wickham. <laughs> so and he knows what he basically knows what's up at this point. Uh, and um, but he doesn't say anything else. Um, and then right, at, and not, not long after that, uh, Caroline Bingley comes up and says, well, you know, I tell you what, Lizzie, uh, you, I don't, I might not believe everything Wickham tells me because my brother says, and Darcy says that he's, he's not that great a guy and he did, and he used Mr. Darcy very badly many years ago, but she doesn't know any of the particular details of it. And so it's not convincing to uh, it's not convincing to uh, uh, to Lizzie. But and, and in the manner that Caroline Bingley warns her, she says, "I find that the young man forgot to tell you, among his other communications, that he was the son of Old Wickham, the late Mister Darcy's steward." And she goes on about how uh, how he used Mister Darcy badly. Uh, I pity, and at the end of this little speech, she says, I pity you, Miss Eliza, for this discovery of your favorite's guilt. But really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better. His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same. 
And so you see what's going on here is everything is aligning against Darcy and Lizzie's opinion of him. Because the, the first person who comes up to defend Darcy is the woman who is always flirting with him. And she and, and while she's talking about how guilty Wickham is, she's talking about how low he is. And so that snootiness makes Elizabeth believe her less, makes her less credible to Lizzie. And so, uh, but then here comes uh, Jane. And Jane says, oh, well, I've been talking to Mr. Bingley about this whole thing, Mr. Darcy and Mr. Wickham. And Bingley says that, that Mr. Wickham's not a nice guy and that he's not a good person. He's done Mr. Darcy wrong. And Lizzie says, well, Mr. Bingley only knows about it from Mr. Darcy, so of course he's going to be biased. And so Lizzie basically decides at the end of all this that she still likes Wickham and she still doesn't like Darcy. But even though what people are telling her is true, but it's the way that she's being told and it's who's telling her this is that prejudice that she has against these people that's working against her. And uh, so, um, let me see here. And so here, and so basically, here, here's here's poor Lizzie, you know, hearing all these things about Mr. Wickham, and uh, but still not convinced. And then along comes poor Mr. Collins, and he says, "Oh wow, I just I just found out that Mr. Darcy as Miss Catherine de Bergs." nephew and now I'm going to go up and introduce myself which would have been considered extremely rude you do not go up and introduce yourself somebody introduces you to someone and this day at this sort of thing you that's not how it went somebody had to introduce you to somebody especially somebody of a higher rank and importance like Mr. Darcy uh, you don't just go up and say, hey, dude, what's up? You know, you don't do that. And so, um, and, and, and so poor Lizzie's having to sit here and watch this unfold. She can't stop Mr. Collins. And so now she's got a cousin going up and making a fool of herself. And uh, then, uh, and, and, and then they go to dinner not long after this. And the whole family decides to just act horribly. Uh, while they were sitting at supper, her mother's talking loudly about how Jane and Mr. Bingley are going to get married and how Jane being married to Mr. Bingley is going to be good for her other daughters because that means her other daughters will, rich, will, will meet more rich young men that they can marry. And she's talking very loudly about this. And Mr. Darcy's right across from her. And this would have been considered vulgar, impertinent talk. You don't make the assumption until, you know, that you don't talk about until they're engaged. And uh, she, keeps talk she keeps on and on and on. And Elizabeth tries to get her to stop. But Mrs. Bennett is too obstinate and she keeps going. Uh, she's going and going and going. And then... The, the sisters are all giggling and laughing and poor Mary goes up and decides to play but she's not a good singer she's not a good piano player and before and before Mary embarrasses herself anymore Lizzie kind of catches her daddy's eye and says and, and he goes and says out loud basically uh, let the other ladies have time to exhibit which would have been embarrassing too so essentially every member of Lizzie's family except Jane is aligning against their reputation like they're all behaving very badly Mrs. Bennett's being loud uh, Lizzie uh, or Lydia and Kitty are being loud and flirting with everybody and dancing with everybody and Mary is singing badly and refusing to stop singing and playing. And Mr. Bennett is being a jerk in front of everybody. <laughs> and all of this is happening all at once. 
and poor Lizzie is just sitting, uh, she can't do anything about it. And she can see all the impropriety and everything that they're doing, but she can do nothing about it. And so she just kind of gives up. And, uh, but, uh, at, at this at this point, he said, uh, she, she says, To Elizabeth, it appeared that had her family made an agreement to expose themselves as much as they could during the evening, it would have been impossible for them to play their parts with more spirit or finer success. And happy did she think it for Bingley and her sister that some of the, some of the ex exhibition had escaped his notice and that his feelings were not of a sort to be much distressed by the folly which he must have witnessed. That his two sisters and Mr. Darcy, however, should have such an opportunity of ridiculing her relations was bad enough, and she could not determine whether the silent contempt of the gentlemen or the insolent smiles of the ladies were more intolerable. So, while everybody's embarrassing the Bennett family, all the Bennett family is embarrassing themselves, Lizzie's looking around, and she sees that Mr. Bingley's not noticing any of it, and he's the most important one at this point. He's just paying attention to Jane, and so Lizzie's okay with that. But then she watches Darcy and Miss, B uh, Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst, and they're like kind of looking at each other like, oh my God, can you believe these people? Do you see what's happening here? You know, they're, 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 they're kind of laughing at Lizzie's family, and it's obvious. Um, and so, and that's really mortifying to her. But at least Bingley isn't seeing it and doesn't care. And that's what's important. Um, but even after the ball is over, uh, Mrs. Bennett somehow makes it so they have to wait an extra 15 minutes for their carriage. And so they're having to sit here with Two women, uh, the the Bingley sisters, the two women who are who keep hinting that they're tired and and are not even saying anything, and, it, and they're obviously annoyed that they're still there. And Mr. Darcy, who's just being silent and and, and you know looking and in a bad mood <laughs> and morose and grave. And uh, uh, but again, Mr. Bingley is sitting there talking to Jane the whole time. But uh, but it's but still all of this is extremely embarrassing to the family. They're behaving badly. Like Mrs. Bennett is inventing all of these ways to spend more time and to make sure that Jane marries Bingley. But what she doesn't realize is her tricks aren't what's going to do it. You know, it's just making them look ridiculous. Uh, and so, you know, she, she, everybody's having to, Lizzie's having to endure all of this embarrassment. Um, and, uh, let me see here. And uh, Mr. Collins just keeps on complimenting and talking incessantly. Uh, so, uh, so, but, uh, so they finally leave, and the end of the chapter is, Mrs. Bennet was perfectly satisfied and quitted the house under the delightful persuasion that, allowing for the necessary preparations of settlements, new carriages, and wedding clothes, she should undoubtedly see her daughter settled at Netherfield in the course of three or four months. Of having another daughter married to Mr. Collins, she thought with equal certainty, and with considerable, though not equal, pleasure. Elizabeth was the least dear to her of all her children, and though the man and the match were quite good enough for her, the worth of each was eclipsed by Mr. Bingley and Netherfield. <laughs> uh, so we get this little bit of revelation right here that Mrs. Bennett doesn't really like Lizzie that much. But, but in a way, it's a compliment to Lizzie. Uh, because uh, probably part of why Mrs. Mrs. Bennett doesn't like her, she's a least favorite daughter, is because she doesn't care about the things. She doesn't care about the things that Mrs. Bennett does to the extent that Mrs. Bennett does, and because she's smart, and because she's witty, and because she doesn't understand half of her jokes. Because and she thinks that she's just being rude. She's not. She doesn't understand it, and so 
Mrs. Bing, Mrs. Bennett doesn't care if Lizzie's happy. She cares if Jane's happy, but she doesn't care if Lizzie is, which is why she's so quick to get rid of her with Mr. Collins, which becomes important in the next chapter. <laughs> so there you have it. But That's a good uh, segue. Yeah. Man, you did a lot of talking there. I was just happy to listen. Mm -hmm. Did so much work this morning on the other seminars. I was glad to be in your audience today. Okay, thank you. No, well, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, again, if anyone would like Jennifer to help with her uh, with your with editing or um, any of the other services that she detailed earlier, uh, it's uh, was it J Avery. At SC, I'm sorry. What, what was it's, your email? Again? It's J Avery SCE at gmail dot com. J Avery SCE at gmail dot com. Yes, sir. All right, and uh, you can catch the previous six versions of our discussion of Pride and Prejudice on the Noetic app, which you should download, and you can follow along on YouTube, SoundCloud, and a variety of other platforms in addition to our own app. So. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, and um, we'll meet again very soon. Okay.